Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Well, good evening. That's right, it's Wednesday, and we know what Wednesday is. The last Wednesday of the month, we're going to be talking about our news and our views. Welcome to Pharmacy News and Views on Achieve CE. Tonight, we're going to be talking about RSV and bed bugs. Now, that sounds like a most interesting topic. So let's get started here. I'm Peter A. Kreckel, RPH Achieve CE's ACPE Administrator. And I am kind of a unique breed of a community pharmacist. I get to do a whole lot of everything. For example, today I did a Mr. Yuck presentation for a nursery school and talked about uh, not taking medication unless a grown adult gives it to you. I've practiced independent community pharmacy my entire career. I taught at St. Francis University in 2005 in the Department of Physician and Sciences. And for the past 16 years, I taught pharmacology to over 700 PA students in your didactic year, taught everything. Uh, all of the disciplines from antibiotic therapy to OBGYN. And I also teach here for Achieve CE, the HIV course where we review eight mechanisms of action, as well as teaching Mr. Yuck Means No. Disclosures, this activity was developed by Achieve CE, free of any commercial support. Peter A. Kreckel, RPH faculty for this educational event. I have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose, nor does Yamini Patel, RPH MBA planner for this educational event, has no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Let's review our learning objectives. And we have... Uh, Pretty much the ones we've been using will recognize the latest updates on COVID-19, how it's going to impact pharmacy practice. We're going to describe the clinical presentation, management, and prevention of seasonal or trending diseases. We're going to review the approved indication, common adverse effects, drug interactions for new drugs to use to treat common disease states, and we're going to identify important drug alerts by the FDA and the implications for patient care. All right, let's get moving with trending news. The first thing is COVID hospital admissions. They're down a little bit. And this kind of varies, I'd have to say, more than a fair amount. It seems to uh, bounce back and forth. Sometimes it's up, you know, 10%. Sometimes it's down 5%. So it's down 5%, but deaths were up 4.2%. But we all know that we're aware we're seeing more COVID cases. I have this uh, really cool map. It was totally green about two months ago, and now we're starting to see some yellow. And now we're starting to see even some little blotches of orange. Finding it interesting that the little blotches of orange aren't in the real big metropolitan areas. So total hospitalizations were down 5%, 4.87 hospital admissions per 100,000, and total deaths were up about 4.2%. This is the one slide that I hope you appreciate because it makes me crazy every time I put it together because I'm forever changing who the top five variants are. And 
I looks like I missed the date on this first column. That would be the most recent one. That date, I think, came from October 10th. Uh, EG.5 was 2.5. 23.6%, FL151 is at 13.5%, XBB1.16.6 is at 10.3%, HV.1 is 19.5%. That's kind of a new player. Uh, we weren't even talking much about him. You look two months ago, it was at 0.5, now it's at 20 percent. And the HK.3 is also a new player as well. XBB.1.5, which is in the injection we are giving, uh, it's percent less than one, uh, probably around the 0.5 percent, but it's okay. The uh, vaccine that we're giving is going to cover all of the uh, variants that are here because they're all of the XBB lineage. So what's happening with COVID shots? I'm not going to teach you much about COVID shots because you've been doing it for probably most of you two and a half to three years. So we're seeing a, a fair amount of interest. I got to tell you, I'm not really excited with the uptake so far. Uh, so some points that I'm seeing from the bench when I'm working, people are still bringing in their paper COVID cards. Matter of fact, we do home visits at Nickman's and a lady called today and she said, I need you to come out. And so I said, okay, good. Been to your house before. No, right, I know right where you're at. Phone rings again, you know, they always got to call twice. And she said, I need you to bring new COVID cards because we filled the last ones up. And I said, okay, I'd be glad to do that. But you do know we report these to the uh, Pennsylvania uh, SIIS database. So your doctor can even look it up. She says, yeah, but I still want to have my card. So I noticed people now are not even specifying what manufacturer there is anymore. Uh, you know, one time it was, do you have Pfizer? Do you have Moderna? Now it's, they just know it's the COVID shot. Mostly senior citizens are who I'm seeing requesting the vaccination. Nursing homes are now administering their own COVID shots now that they're commercially available. Last year, I was busy, busy, busy doing COVID shots in nursing homes. And this year, I asked a couple of them and said, oh, we're just going to do them ourselves. Remember, last year, the pharmacies had to get it from the federal government. We could bill for them. This year, they're able to bill for them themselves. Uh, we're using Moderna at Nickman's, uh, just my preference, my preference because they're pre-filled syringes. So there's no time wasted drawing up out of a one dose vial. Uh, we're using Moderna just simply because they're pre-filled syringes. Uh, a big COVID update, uh, Molnupiravir or Legevro uh, transition to the commercial market. The transition is to occur in November of 2023. And so as we get closer to November, and hey, it's a week away, uh, the ASPR will wind down the distribution of Molnupiravir or Legevrio to maximize use of the government purchase supply that's already positioned in dispensing locations. Starting October 2nd, HHS did move away from the current threshold replenishment, you're familiar with that. If you use it, they replace it to a request-based approach using the current out-of-cycle request process. Early to mid-November, the ordering from the government purchase supply will close for Legevrio, and the product is expected to be for commercial purchase, supposed to be available beginning in November. Good RX, and that's the only place I can find a price for this. Uh, GoodRx is pricing it at about $700 per course, and any supply that the government distributes must remain available free to the patients. Providers must use government purchase supplies up first. Once they're depleted or they expire, whichever comes first, then they will need to transition to the purchasing. All right, we're not going to talk about Paxlovid because there's just not enough data as to when the actual firmed updates are going to be. And you know, we'll be talking about it when we get together next month. Let's talk about seasonal diseases. Everybody is talking about RSV. I made a really cool flyer. Uh, it's actually two page uh, front back glossy, beautiful flyer. And today a gentleman walked in and he said, I need to talk to Pete about RSV. So I said, yeah, what's up? And he said, well, uh, as you know, I'm on chemotherapy, on immunotherapy for lung cancer, and I got my COVID shot. You gave me that. Thank you. You gave me my flu shot. Thank you. He says, but I wonder, do I need RSV? And I said, my gut tells me yes, but you're on an immunotherapy. Let's let the doctor who's the expert in immunotherapy determine. I said, but here's the flyer. 
It gives you all of the data about it being much more lethal in adults than it is kids as far as the numbers go. And I said, take this to your doctor's office. We're using Orexv and uh, see if you would be a candidate for it. So yeah, we're getting questions and we're not getting the easy ones. So RSV is the most common cause of bronchiolitis, which is that inflammation of the small airways in the lungs and pneumonia, which is inflammation of the lungs in kids under one in the United States. So RSV can also infect adults, but the cases are usually milder, usually milder. And according to the CDC, each year in the United States, RSV leads to approximately 2.1 million outpatient or non-hospitalized visits among children younger than five years of age. Call the pediatrician and it's taken care of there. Then we go to 58,000 to 80,000 hospitalizations among children younger than five years of age. 60,000 to 120,000 hospitalizations in adults my age, 65 years of age and older. There's 6,000 to 14,000 deaths among adults 65 years and older, and there's 100 to 300 deaths in children younger than five years of age. Every death is tragic, but when we look at it, we can see that the adults have 20 times, 20 to 30 times more deaths than the pediatric population. Let's talk about the virus a little bit. Uh, the RSV is a single-stranded negative strand RNA virus belonging to the Paramyxoviridae family and its genus pneumovirus. RSV was discovered in chimpanzees in 1955 and subsequently confirmed to be a human pathogen shortly thereafter. There's really only one serotype of RSV, but it's classified into two strains, strain A and strain B, with differences consisting of variation in the structure of several structural membrane proteins, mostly the attachment protein, where it latches on to the cells. And the structure of RSV is that of a bilipid layer envelope surrounded by a ribonucleoprotein protein core with several membrane proteins, one which functions in the attachment to host cells and one which functions in fusion to host cells. So I know we're kind of thinking of that uh, Professor Pete's uh, HIV lecture where we have attachment and then we have fusion. Well, nearly all kinds of RSV by the time they reach nearly all kids contract RSV by the time they're five years of age. They all get it eventually with most kids having the disease before their second birthday. So let's go over the basics, the symptoms for mild disease. Uh, symptoms usually occur rapidly after infection occurs, usually within four to six days of exposure. Symptoms of RSV infection usually include a runny nose, decrease in appetite, coughing, sneezing, fever, and wheezing. So the treatment of mild cases, you want to manage the pain and the fever. You always avoid aspirin. Ibuprofen, never use ibuprofen in children less than six months of age. Anything under six months of age, you have to give them acetaminophen. So the ibuprofen for the kids six months of age and older is four to 10 milligrams per kilo every six hours. I know that's a pretty good range. Most pediatricians will just peg it at eight milligrams per kilogram. Acetaminophen is usually dosed at 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram every four to six hours with a maximum of five doses per day. I had an old pediatrician uh, tell me, she said, Pete, you want a shortcut? You don't need to even know the kilograms that give you the weight in pounds, multiply pounds by five, and that will give you the dose. And of course, adequate hydration is necessary too for treatment of RSV. So how is RSV spread? Well, they have it figured out sort of, but there's still a little bit of discussion as to one of the uh, potential spreads uh, mechanisms. The respiratory virus is spread by three different transmission routes, contact, direct or indirect, droplet and aerosol transmission. RSV is transmitted by the way of contact transmission and droplet spread. So contact transmission refers to a direct virus transfer from an infected person to a susceptible individual, either you know, directly or by contaminated hands, like kissing the baby, holding the little baby's hands, which then immediately go into their mouth, or indirect virus transfer like 
fomites. Uh, fomites are things like toys or any hard surfaces. RSV can be recovered from countertops for several hours, but only for several minutes from absorptive surfaces such as paper tissues and skin. But it can remain on a countertop for a couple hours, hard surface. Transmission of viruses through the air can occur by droplets or aerosols. And the differences between a droplet and aerosol is particle size. And the commonly accepted cutoff size between large droplets and small aerosols is five microns. So anything over five microns, and that number varies too, depending on the study, but we'll just use five uh, microns, is going to be a, uh, a droplet and aerosols uh, are slower. So let's, let's take a look at the definitions. Droplets generated during coughing, sneezing, or talking do not remain suspended in the air and travel less than one meter before settling on the mucosa of close contacts or environmental surfaces, they're larger. Aerosols, well, they're they're lighter, okay? And aerosols have a slow settling velocity because they're lighter and remain suspended in the air longer, but they can travel further. There's increasing evidence that RSV could be spread by aerosols. And the one uh, study I was reading said that they were studying babies, um, in an area and like around the baby itself, they were ever able to uh, find RSV floating around the baby as an aerosol. And definitely these aerosols is gonna land on a toy, kid picks up the toy, and then you have contact transmission. So what can we do to protect ourselves and our children? Well, let's look at the non-pharmacological members uh, measures. First thing, uh, hand washing in all settings, particularly when high-risk infants are at risk for exposure to respiratory infections from older siblings. Practice cough hygiene, cover your mouth, cough into your elbow, dispose of tissues immediately, avoid exposure to combustible tobacco like cigars and cigarettes, and if possible, avoid daycare during the RSV season. And I know that's easier said than done because the RSV season well, it's pretty long and we're gonna talk about that too. The reason we're gonna talk about it is I am totally, totally thrilled tonight to welcome a very special guest to our presentation. Dr. Amy P. Bernard, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology at the University of Colorado and Shoots Medical Campus. She has a PhD in cellular immunology and molecular biology. Her research spans human B cell development and autoimmune disorders like systemic lupus erythematosus. I have a patient uh, 12 years old that has it. So this could be another presentation or another visit from her. Uh, in academia, she serves on curriculum reform committees and is a course director imparting knowledge of immunology across multiple programs, including medical, dental, and physician assistant studies. Beyond the classroom, she mentors a nonprofit after school science program and serves as an executive director for the Human Immunology and Immunotherapy Initiative, where she coordinates research and clinical infrastructure for immunotherapies in cancer and autoimmune disease. I couldn't be happier to welcome Dr. Amy Pugh Bernard to our program. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at, and I'm going to have uh, Dr. Bernard comment on this, is Massachusetts General and the United States see a massive increase two months earlier, or two months early in 2022. As we were talking, RSV season generally starts September, October, maybe even November for the most part. So when you see these bumps, 2017, it started in November, started pretty much in November of 2018 through 19. In 2019, it started a little bit early, maybe in September. But oh my goodness, when we get to 2022, it looks like it never really went away entirely and started really jumping in July and then again in August. So, Dr. Bernard, welcome to the program, and let's uh, have your comments on the timing of the RSV season. Hello. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so this is, a, I think, a really interesting question because 
Um, during the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of people took a lot of precautions with, you know, isolating or um, distancing masks and things like that. So I think with the RSV season starting or the RSV coming around earlier in 2022, and then seeing the increases in um, pediatric um, patients in hospitals, certainly the Children's Hospital of Colorado um, was at a tipping point and started opening up beds um, in unusual, not unusual, but areas beyond where they would normally have um, kids in the hospital. Um, and it seemed like that it, it didn't kind of regress like it normally would. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we were taking such great precautions during the pandemic, not being exposed to many um, as many things by maybe um, not going to daycare, not going um, to the grocery store, things like that. And then coming into contact and just, it had an opportunity to kind of take advantage of, I think, the the population that was kind of reemerging into, um, you know, the world. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah, RSV season rears its ugly head from October through April. That's what we normally see with the peak occurring in January and February. RSV got an early start in 2022, yep. as we were discussing, and the large resurgence is believed to be due to previous COVID precautions, which I, I'd, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, are they going to get it anyhow, and did we just kind of stave it off? Mm. Is that kind of where, did we really prevent anything or did we just delay it? You know, I think you're right. It, it probably was that we we may have delayed it because, as you said earlier, most kids um, by the age of five have had RSV. So it's likely that um, there was just kind of an overwhelming amount of kids that were coming into contact with it for the first time, kind of all at the same time. So you were likely seeing the increase in hospitalizations due to the due to the fact that you weren't having, you know, the number of cases that you normally would at, at a certain period of time. It was kind of lumped together because of the reemergence into, I think, into the world. And then it also took advantage of us a little bit in the sense that um, it seemed like it, it kind of extended its usual season. Okay. So now I'm going to drag you out of your immunology lab and I'm bringing you to the drugstore. This yeah. was a question, and that's why I just recently added it on Friday. A patient, uh, I said to her, okay, now you've had your uh, COVID shot and you had your flu shot. Yep. And I said, are you interested in RSV? And she says, RSV, you know, doesn't that only hit kids? And she said, where's this disease been? I never even heard of it. So some mm. feel this disease is overblown because we have a vaccine now. And what are your thoughts? Hasn't RSV always been around? And why do we have all the hype now? I'd love to hear what you have to say <laughs> about the people that are saying, well, yeah, you know, we didn't have osteoporosis till we had Bozomax. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I talk to people that are vaccine hesitant all the time, a variety of vaccines, but yes, it's correct. RSV has been around this whole time, but it's, it's severe, like you showed earlier in um, people, I think 60 or 65 and above with those hospitalizations. And then um, young kids, particularly if they are under the age of one coming into their first RSV season, um, you did show that there were less hospitalizations in those young kids. But for the kids that get it and the, the adults that have very serious disease and or death, I think it's worth preventing, you know, any of that suffering or long-term consequences and or death with the vaccine. I mean, of course, you don't know which young kid will be um, more susceptible. I mean, part of it has to do with age and, you know, our lungs do continue to develop in the first year of life. Um, but you just, you don't know, you know, which is it going to be your grandma? <laughs> you know, is it going to be, you just don't know. So I think that I don't think it's overblown. I think having a vaccine prevents, um, you know, harm and disease and hospitalization and things like that. So I think it's a really beneficial tool that can just help keep a lot of us healthy and safe and out of the hospital or having some severe, um, severe. We have the tools and the drug companies are, are promoting it. And yep. uh, I, I've had my RSV shot. I'm not going to lie to you. 
Couldn't wait for it to come out. Matter of fact, I'll tell you how early I got mine, Amy. Mine was denied on Medicare because it wasn't loaded into the system. So I waited a couple of weeks because they had it cheap. And yeah. once it was approved, uh, my daughter Gretchen stuck it right in the arm. All right. So yeah. let's go to our uh, let's go to our next slide. Uh, let's see. Uh, the vaccines are now available. My wife, Denise, and I both turned 65 this year, and we are very proud card-carrying Medicare recipients. Uh, how can we community pharmacists connect with our patients regarding the need for adult vaccinations of RSV? Do you think that all 60-plus-year-old patients should get the RSV vaccine, even if they're healthy as a horse like me? Uh, and are you seeing any vaccine hesitancy? <laughs> um, so I think, I think that the RSV vaccine for anyone would be an, a good idea. Um, I think also, like you mentioned before, um, if someone has other health conditions or, um, any concerns, they should bring it up with their physician to make sure it's a, it's a shared decision. Um, like you said, you are healthy and you got the vaccine. I'm guessing the reason why is that you don't want to be um, you don't want to be sick from RSV. You'd rather you know enjoy your grandkids. You'd probably rather enjoy spending time with friends and family. So preventing yourself from taking any time out of you know a fun-filled life and uh, all the adventures that goes along with you know your job and your family. And then um, so I would say yes, I would recommend it. But I'd actually you know definitely talk to your physician. And then vaccine hesitancy, I. I have made it my part of my job as an immunologist is I will talk to anybody about vaccines. So I, I do see vaccine hesitancy um, in a variety, uh, all kinds of vaccines. Um, I've been reading about the RSV vaccine for pregnant women recently, and it seems like there may be a little bit of an increase in hesitancy just because it's new, um, but it has gone through clinical trials, so it's safe and effective. Um, but I think anytime, um, you know, people question what goes in their body, I think that's a really good idea. They then need to talk to people that, you know, kind of understand the science behind it and get some answers. Okay, terrific. All right. Um, well, let's talk about uh, protecting newborns. Now, we have two vaccines for RSV. I've talked about them a couple times on this program. We have a Brisevo by Pfizer. It's indicated for prevention of RSV in adults age 60 and pregnant patients between week 32 and 36. A RexV by GSK is only indicated for adults over age 60 plus. Would we expect a RexV to get an indication for pregnancy? If not, why not? And are there any differences in the vaccines that pharmacists need to be aware of? Is one better than the other? Or what are your thoughts on the Abrisvo versus a RexV? Yeah, so um, I would I would expect that it would likely be indicated for pregnancy. I was kind of looking around for some literature. However, they usually don't start to publish some of those things until it's been um, approved for a certain use. So I would it would surprise me to think that they weren't looking um, in that direction for use in pregnancy. It doesn't seem like there would be any reason why. Um, to not do that. As far as the differences between the vaccines, they're both the same type of formulation. They're both recombinant subunit vaccines, which essentially just means that the outer portion of the virus that you showed on um, a couple slides back, those, those proteins that are on the surface, it's essentially just kind of cutting those proteins off and putting them in the vaccine. So there's no nucleic acid. There's nothing that would cause infection whatsoever. It's just the outer proteins. But as far as the abrisvio, um, that is bivalent, which means it has two types of protein subunits that are found on the outer surface. And then the Erexv, it's, it sounds like from what I've read that um, that is monovalent. So it just has one of those proteins, but they are both um, very, um, have been proven to be very effective. So that's really the only difference. And the one that's approved for, for pregnancy and for adults over 60 is the Brisville, which has uh, is bivalent, has both of those protein um, recombinant subunit pieces or proteins. Okay, good. Thank you. And mm -hmm. 
Finally, uh, <laughs> let's bring real life and real kids into this. Ella is a one-year-old female whose mom is a pharmacist, and Beth gave me permission. Matter in fact, she was honored to be part of this program. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ella is a one-year-old female whose mom is a pharmacist. I work with Beth. She was born October 2022, and at seven weeks last December, she presented with apnea and bradycardia. She had no risk factors for RSV. She was hospitalized at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Okay, that's the baby on the top. She is a vibrant, beautiful little kid now, but I said, I want to show a real baby what a real sick baby looks like. And this other little guy, that's Leo. He's my seven month old grandson and he is entering his first RSV season. And both children would be candidates for Bay Fortis. Uh, both moms are looking high and low for Bay Fortis uh, to get their children through the RSV season. Uh, discussion point number four, should every baby be protected? Should every mom be looking for Bay Fortis for their kid? And this is late breaking. I mean, I found this out this morning and I said, I got to update the questions for Amy. Uh, Leo is getting his Bay Fortis on Friday. So should all babies entering their first RSV season get Bay Fortis? What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's going to be expensive. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so if you look at Ella... You know, she was seven weeks old, it looks like, when she was diagnosed with RSV and then had to be hospitalized. You know, and part of that is the lungs are not completely developed at birth. They, they take several um, months for the lungs to continue development post-birth. I have kind of some experience that myself because I had twins and they were born a little early, so they actually gave me a... Uh, an injection uh, like about a week before they were born to stimulate a little bit more of lung development because they knew they'd be born early and there was more of a risk for lung complications um, with, you know, things like RSV or flu or things like that. Um, of course, there was no uh, vaccine for me back, you know, several years ago for RSV, but I certainly did get my, my flu shot and the Tdap as recommended. However, because babies, um, particularly in that first year of life, their lungs are a little bit less developed, um, that's gonna be a little bit more challenging if they do get RSV. So I, I would recommend, you know, under the age of one, going into that first RSV season um, to, to get uh, this type of protection. Um, Again, I would also recommend any moms that are pregnant parents that's possible to get that um, Abrisvo, that vaccine, because when you, between that 32 to 36 week window, because those antibodies will cross the placenta into the baby and then provide protection, you know, for months post birth. So that's really beneficial. Um, so yes, I would recommend every baby because I'm guessing that Ella, like you said, had no risk factors. So, you know, you just don't know. Um, so to keep her protected. And then as and far as you your grandson, hear, that's incredibly exciting news. <laughs> and if you hear Beth tell this story, she tears up every time. She said, I took my baby to the pediatrician and, you know, they were doing sternal stimulations yeah. to keep her up and breathing. And, you know, you see the tears in her eyes and you say, you know, this was almost a year ago. And, uh, and that's why I, I'm in your corner, Dr. Bernard. I will take a shot every year if I need to, if it's going to protect my grandchildren and anybody else's baby. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any closing comments for us? This has been fantastic talking to you. This is great. No, I think uh, I'd say, you know, I'm obviously pro vaccine, <laughs> pro science, exactly. pro therapeutic. <laughs> so yes, thank you for having me on. All righty. Well, we're going to uh, wrap things up here with a little review of the RSV vaccines. Dr. Bernard, it's been such a pleasure, and I hope we have you back real soon. Thank, Thank you, you, and good night. Okay, the RSV vaccines, as Dr. Bernard explained to us, uh, by Pfizer, or Brisevo is the one that's used to immunize pregnant women and adults ages 60 and older. Brisevo protects by developing the lower uh, against developing lower respiratory tract diseases uh, by the RSV virus. Abrisvo works by developing immunity, as Dr. Bernard said, to two RSV proteins. 
Our XV uh, is a single protein, and its numbers were equally impressive, 82% effective in preventing lower respiratory diseases in people ages 60 and older. That's me, so I'm protected. And over 94% effective in preventing lower respiratory diseases from RSV in people age 60 and older with asthma, diabetes, COPD. Uh, I don't fit into that uh, realm, but you can see anybody that's uh, picking up their Spariva handy inhaler should definitely be encouraged to get an RSV vaccine. So when we compare the two, they're both for adults 60 plus, a breeze bow by Pfizer is the, uh, is the one for pregnant patients. Uh, the RSV uh, pre-FA and RSV pre-FB recombinant proteins are expressed in genetically engineered Chinese hamster ovary cell lines. So that's where they get them from. All right. And a lot of the stuff that uh, we use in the world of vaccines seem to come from Chinese hamster ovary cell lines. Reconstitution, this is where they're a little bit different. Uh, the Abreze, though, is pretty cool. It has a vial and then it has this adapter that it kind of clicks on and pushes. And then you uh, mix the two together and then draw it up with a syringe. Whereas the Erexv, Think of it as it's like your Shingrix. You have the dry powder in the one vial, you have the uh, diluent in the other, you mix them together, you draw it out and you inject it. So reconstitution, very similar to, to Shingrix. However, the Abrisvo by Pfizer is pretty cool with the vial adapter. What I kind of like about that is you're only entering the vial once. And uh, so you're not wiping off the lubricant or having to change needles. You can see the cost is pretty close. It's about 280 bucks for the Abrisvo and 266.70 uh, for the Orexvi. The Orexvi, you got to buy boxes of 10. So you make sure you have, you know, uh, the desire there by you and your patients to protect people against RSV. If you're just going to buy a one-off once in a while, Abrisvo might be a better choice because you can either buy them individually or by buying them a box of five. Let's talk a little bit about pav pavalizumab or Synergis injection. That's been around for a long time. It was approved in 1998. And you can see uh, why it's probably going to be displaced. It's available in 50 and 100 milligrams for intramuscular injection, used to help prevent serious lung damage caused by the RSV virus. Um, in kids that are born prematurely, at or before 35 weeks or who are six months of age or less at the beginning of RSV season uh, with chronic lung condition called bronchopulmonary dysplasia that needed medical treatment within six months and who are 24 months of age, they can be treated with synergist. Those that were born with certain types of heart disease who are 24 months of age or less at the beginning of RSV season can also be protected. The dose here is 15 milligrams per kilo at the first visit and month thereafter. As you can see, they're uh, larger vials, 50 and 100 milligram. And at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, their clinical pharmacist there in the pediatric unit, one of my former students, Becca, is an amazing, amazing uh, student, amazing pharmacist now. And she was telling me that they actually will uh, pool together to uh, get the most doses. If, if some kid needs, say, a 35 uh, milligram dose, and then maybe another little one might need only 15 milligram, they'll pull them out of the vials and do everything they can to decrease vaccine wastage. Okay, and Bay Fortis, this is not really an RSV vaccine, but we threw it under the vaccines. This is, again, a monoclonal antibody for the protection of the babies. It's available in the U.S. ahead of the upcoming 2023-24 RSV season. Bay Fortis is a laboratory-made version of an antibody that helps the immune system fight off RSV. So these are already antibodies set to attack. All right. And under F FDA approval, the babies, including preterm infants, can receive a single injection to protect themselves for their first season of RSV, which, as we said, lasts about five months. This can be given to kids up to age two, and they can receive another dose to protect them during their second season if they're facing the virus. So it looks like they might even get to use it like now and then maybe a year from now if needed. Before it has already been approved in Canada, Europe, and the United Kingdom since last RSV season, since October 31st, 2022. 
Bayfortis is the first preventative option proved to protect a broad infant population. Remember those real narrow guidelines that you had for synergists? These are wide open. Uh, so it's a uh, wide open, broad infant population, including those born healthy at term, like Leo was, or those that are born preterm or with specific health conditions that make them vulnerable to severe RSV disease. The single dose can be flexibly administered at the beginning of the RSV season at birth for those that are born during the RSV season. So pretty excited about it. And I'm pretty excited that my grandson's going to be getting his dose. All right, let's go to our first assessment question. Which of the following RSV specific products is indicated for a pregnant person between 32 and 36 weeks gestation? That's a typo. 32 to 36 weeks gestation. Is it a RexV, a Breezevo, Bayfortis, or Synergist? Go ahead, key in your answer now, and I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to do it because we got a lot of material to cover. Go ahead and key in now. All right, let's see how you did on it. RSV specific product. Let's see. Oh, most of you got it. Very well done. Of course, that correct answer was a breeze bow, indicated between 32 and 36 weeks gestation. All right, top story, consult of the month. I know this, many of you, this is your favorite uh, column. And if you have a good consult of the month or something you want to share, send me an email, farmcanoe at aol.com, and uh, we'll feature your story. So here's the top story. Bed bugs discovered at Uniontown Area High School. That's the town that I practice in. I, it says Lamont Furnace, but Lamont Furnace is just a little suburb, I guess we could call it. So what is going on with bed bugs? I mean, everybody's talking about them. Just last night, watching the Pittsburgh News with my wife, and they're talking about a bed bug infestation in Latrobe, uh, Pennsylvania, home of Rolling Rock beer. Uh, because of DDT, remember hearing about DDT? Some of you people with as much gray hair as I have would remember uh, DDT rather well. Uh, they sprayed it around like crazy to keep the mosquitoes at bay. It was used extensively in the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s. Bed bugs uh, were virtually eliminated by the use of DDT. Bed bugs are wingless insects that feed on warm blooded animals. Bed bugs are small, flat, parasitic insects. They're reddish brown in color, wingless, and they range from one to seven millimeters roughly the size of Lincoln's head on a penny, if you're not real good with millimeters like I'm not. Uh, they feed solely on the blood of people and animals while they sleep. They do not transmit disease though, and they can live several months without a blood meal. Bed bugs have resurged and resurgence is blamed on the DDT working out of the environment. That's the good news is the peregrine falcons are coming back as well. Uh, so the DDT is working out of the environment and the bed bugs resistance to DDT and several other pesticides have made these a real nuisance. Bed bugs are nocturnal. They hide during the day in places such as the seams of mattresses, box springs, bed frames, headboards, dresser tables, inside cracks or crevices, behind wallpaper, or any other clutter or objects around the bed. Bed bugs have been shown to be able to travel over 100 feet in a night, but they tend to live within about eight feet of where people sleep, probably in the box springs. So what do we want to share with our patients? What are some patient care points? Uh, they're associated with unsanitary conditions. However, and this is a big however, they may be found in the cleanest of homes, hotels, or other buildings that have uh, occurred in all social and economic classes. Because it just means somebody that was in that room before you had bed bugs. Okay, so it'll hit all social and economic classes. Infestations most often occur where there's a high turnover of occupants, like hotels, motels, cruise ships, dormitories, apartment complexes, and shelters. They are difficult to get rid of. Uh, it may take several vacuuming attempts. 
of the affected area and application of pesticides. This is interesting. You call an exterminator, the chances of the bed bugs being eliminated by just one application by an exterminator are only about 6%. That's how resistant they are. Bed bugs feed on a blood meal, and that would be you and me if we have bed bugs, and heaven forbid we do. Uh, they feed on you for about 10 minutes and they inject an anticoagulant. Females need blood to produce eggs. The female produces about one to seven eggs about 10, in about 10 days. So if there's lots of people to feed off of, she's gonna eat you know, frequently and knock out maybe seven eggs. With ideal temperatures between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the bed bug population can double in probably about 10 to 12 days. Ooh. So patient care points. Here's what the bites look like. The bite reaction usually presents as a red bump or a wheel, ranging in size from a few millimeters to a centimeter. It usually does not have a red puncture mark in the middle. The bites can occur in lines or clusters of three or four. Patient care points uh, to prevent the spread. And this is a big deal, especially like say you lived in a duplex and the person next door to you wasn't practicing the level of hygiene you were. So you wanna seal any small hiding areas. Use silicon caulk to seal cracks and crevices to eliminate hiding places and get the bed bugs out in the open. Remove infested items. Place them in a sealed bag and treat them. Items that cannot be treated should be placed in a sealed bag or a storage container and left there for up to a year. Remember with head lice, you know, you put the kids uh, pillows or you put their stuffed animals in for 14 days. For bed bugs, it's going to take a year if you do that. Uh, purchase protective covers. It's uh, sealed mattresses and box springs. Uh, with covers that seal, the bed bugs will get trapped inside and die. So we're talking those really nice ones with the zippers on so that if you do catch them inside, they can't get out. Vacu vacuum after each use, seal the bag as tightly as possible, and immediately throw it in the outdoor trash container. Discard furniture responsibly if you can't safely eliminate the bed bugs. Destroy it so someone else won't be tempted to bring it home. For example, rip the covers and remove the stuffing from furniture items. Get a big old pocket knife and whack it. Uh, use spray paint to mark furniture with bed bugs. Have infested items picked up by the trash collection agency as soon as possible. And don't discard furniture if you can safely eliminate the bed bugs from it. And exterminating the bed bugs. Okay, let's. How do we get rid of them? Bed bugs are becoming more resistant to conventional pesticides. Many insecticides are just not effective at killing the eggs. So a second treatment is often necessary to kill the juveniles after the eggs hatch. Uh, bed bug interceptor traps and gray shelf on a really good picture of one here. Um, and it's that uh, red disc on the bottom because they can't climb in. So they can be placed under the legs of furniture to catch bed bugs and keep them from climbing up the legs. Pest control services. Now, the 6% is usually for spraying the insecticide. They'll use permethrin or an alpine uh, type, but the pest control services will use heat treatment as well. They will heat your room up to 118 degrees Fahrenheit and maintain it for at least 70 minutes in target area. Hop online and review it. It's, it's pretty entertaining to read. They'll tell you, make sure you don't have plants, medicine, or chocolate bars in the area to be treated. So all stages of bed bugs are killed when this is done properly. Heat treatment does not prevent bed bugs from coming back into a home and reinfesting it, however. So again, you want to make sure that your patients are sealing off those areas. Okay, treating the itch. Oral antihistamines seem to help relieve the itching. So we can do loratadine, chlorpheniramine, diphenhydramine, any of the first or second generation antihistamines. There's a poor response to oral corticosteroids. So if you're thinking, you know, poison ivy, whack them with 60 milligrams of prednisone and taper it down, doesn't work. Topical corticosteroids, however, seem to be effective. Use the light ones like hydrocortisone or triamcinolone, and you might have to treat secondary infections. And as we said, the take-home point, bed bugs do not cause diseases. However, they can cause allergic reactions that can cause very intense itching. All right, so what's new with the FDA? What is the latest and greatest from the FDA? 
you'll be surprised to see that we have a new drug for IBS, etrosimod, etrosimod, or valsipity by Pfizer was approved on 10, 12, 2023. Yeah, that makes it not even two weeks old. It's used to treat moderately to severe ulcerative colitis in adults. Its mechanism of action is an SP1 receptor modulator, a selective sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator that helps control inflammation in the large intestine. And the SP1 receptor modulators are known to control inflammation. Have you heard of them before? Yes, you have. Uh, what rhymes with mode? Well, Fingal mode and Oxana mode, Gelinia and Zaposia are multiple sclerosis drugs, and they have the same mechanism of action, but they work more specifically on the oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes are those cells that uh, kind of follow the nerve tracks and keep the myelin sheath on. They keep essentially wrapping insulation uh, along the myelin sheath. So yeah, same uh, mechanism of action, but these work specifically in the gut. Uh, the dose is two milligrams orally once a day. So what are some of its side effects? Well, remember uh, with uh, fingolimid or gelinia, you have to have the patient hooked up to an EKG machine when you even give them their first dose. So uh, bradycardia can be an issue. Uh, so you want to do an ECG, an electrocardiogram, to rule out pre-existing cardiac conduction abnormalities before you initiate therapy. Uh, they might very well just have a condition that they're sort of on the edge of bradycardia. This will push them over the edge. Also, you want to monitor blood pressure during treatment as well. Immunosuppression and infections, you want to do a complete blood count before you initiate therapy. Liver failure, another side effect, do LFTs, liver function tests, before administration. Malignancies, you wanna obtain a skin examination prior to or shortly after the start of treatment and periodically during treatment, especially if they would have risk factors. And macular edema, it's gonna affect the eyes. It may increase the risk of macular edema. So you want to obtain a baseline evaluation of the fundus, including the macula. And finally, fetal harm is a big problem. So contraception is recommended during treatment and for at least seven days after the course is completed. All right, let's take a look at assessment question number two. Which of the following is preferred treatment for skin irritation due to bed bug bites? Do we whack them with prednisone? How about dexamethasone? chlorpheniramine or ketoconazole. Go in and key in your answer now and we'll give you about 15 seconds to take care of that. All right, let's take a look and see how you responded. The correct answer is chlorpheniramine or any oral antihistamine is the correct answer. And the topical corticosteroids could be of value too. All right, very good. And now it's time for the many of your favorite parts of news and views is where you get to play. In, and you get to talk, and this becomes part of your show, Editorial on Pharmacy Times. Well, I'm going to skip my editorial. I want to know what you have to say. Here's what everyone in the profession is talking about, walkouts and more. We heard about the CVS pharmacy staff walks out in Kansas City. Walgreen pharmacy staff walks out in Arizona, Washington, Massachusetts, and Oregon, and Rite Aid. Rite Aid declared bankruptcy. So uh, if you are a Rite Aid employee, if you have anything you can share with us, you know, obviously we don't need to send spies into Rite Aid, but if there's anything you can share with our participants, what do you know about the Rite Aid bankruptcy and uh, what's going on in your world? How do you feel about the pharmacy walkouts? You know, there's a part of us that says, we have to take care of our patients. And if we walk out today, when we come back, we know there's gonna be more work. And the other half of you says, well, you know, if we don't get their attention now, are we going to? This is an unusual situation. When I was a little kid growing up, 
Spear Carbon, which was down the street, we lived kind of in the industrial section of town. You could say the wrong side of the tracks. And uh, the, the picketers would go out on strike and they had a booth there. They held signs and they wanted 25 cents an hour increase. This isn't that. This is a bunch of professionals that are very highly compensated that are saying, we don't, I'm not going to talk about the money. We want enough staff so we can do better patient care, so we can decrease the number of errors that go out of our pharmacy, so we can decrease the uh, amounts of issues of not being able to consult our patients. So we can increase maybe doing a better job with somebody with vaccine hesitancy and talking to them more and uh, giving them the benefits of the vaccines that we're able to administer. So go ahead, type in the chat box, let's light it up and, uh, and see what you have to say about uh, about all of the things that I kicked up. Are you a Rite Aid employee? Go ahead, type me a message and I'll be glad to share it. I think it's very interesting that, that us pharmacists are truly taking a stand and saying, you know, enough is enough and we need more help to be able to do the better job. Let's face it, we're all a bunch of overachievers, right? You had to be, you know, the cream of the crop to get into pharmacy school. When I uh, applied to pharmacy school in 1976, uh, in, in September of 76, uh, there were 600 applications for 100 slots. I was fortunately one of the six to get in. And so, you know, we're, we're not looking to, to beat anybody up even for more money. A lot of times the, the money is the easy part. So um, I'd love to read what you have to say. So go ahead, type into the chat box uh, what your questions are. If you have any questions specifically for Dr. Amy Bernard, I was totally excited to be able to have her as part of our, our discussion tonight. I think we all see challenges, you know, with uh, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Karen's saying, I work in a small pharmacy and it is amazing ambient. We all take care, we all take special care of the patient. It's Locatel Pharmacy in Miami. So you work in a small pharmacy. Uh, Karen, I've only worked independent pharmacy with the exception of the first six months. And I worked for the first six months of my career with Rite Aid because I was coming out of school, had a little bit of debt. I don't even want to mention the $5,000. Oh, I mentioned it. Uh, that's all my debt was coming out of school in 1981. Uh, so I was looking at the money. And uh, after six months of working, I talked to my district manager and said, you know, this business is really picking up and I need more tech help. And he said, Pete, I've watched you work. And if you quit talking to those patients, you'll have plenty of time to get our paperwork done. That was even before computers, vaccines and all of that. And I went home that night and I said to my wife, Denise, I made a mistake. She says, what? I said, five years ago, picking this profession. She says, no, we're not giving up yet. I wanted to go back to pit, pick up a PhD and teach. I think it has always been my passion. And so uh, I got a job at Cop Drug, worked there for 26 years and had an amazing career there. I saw he was going to be selling to Rite Aid. So I went to Thompson Pharmacy, another small local chain in Altoona. Uh, Billy had five stores. And then I moved down here to live closer to my daughter, who happens to be now my next door neighbor. That's Leo's mommy. And uh, I took that job at Nickman's Drugstore. He has five stores. So I've had a, an amazing career of teaching, of doing a lot of online education, like with Achieve CE. And I think that's what I my best advice to any of you listening could be. And I'm sure Dr. Bernard would tell you the same thing. Follow your dreams, follow your passion, follow what you think can make the biggest impact on people. But most of all, the biggest impact on you and your career. We have an amazing profession where, unfortunately, uh, only, I think it's 14% of the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy students said they would commit to community pharmacy. 19%, and this was a statistic that really floored me, they don't know what they're going to do. So they're saying, I know what I'm not going to do, and it's not going to be community pharmacy. And that's really unfortunate because at one point, about 80% of all pharmacists were community pharmacists taking care of patients. And I think we're seeing more and more of our uh, colleagues on the bench are saying, you know, enough is enough of it. I uh, turned 65 in May, and first thing I did was May 1st, I'm done. Uh, the dispensing can be a challenge, 
And so I do just the clinical services now. As I said, I went to nursery school this morning. Yesterday, I spent a good portion of the day doing flu shots in a nursing home. So, you know, follow your dreams, get the preparation you need, reach out and connect. And that's the beauty of formats like Achieve CE, where we can all get together in a room, share your stories, and you never know exactly what is going to come about. So it looks like it's uh, almost eight o'clock. I think it's time we can uh, share the evaluation code. Uh, let's take a look in the chat box and see if we have it. Uh, the evaluation code is 8328. It's in your chat box. 8328, it's in your chat box. So go ahead and uh, fill out that Google form and uh, we can re we'll report it then to CE Broker or CPE Monitor for you. I'm so glad you joined me for this presentation. I hope you learned as much as I did. I sincerely uh, appreciate all of you attending these types of webinars where it's a great opportunity for us to get together. And in the case of Dr. Amy Bernard, I would never get to run into a Dr. Amy Bernard uh, where I'm at here if it wasn't for Achieve CE News and Views. So Dr. Bernard, hope to work with you again sometime. And thank you so much for joining us. We know there are a lot of places you can get your continuing education, but we're so glad you chose Achieve CE. Thank you so much and good night. Good night. Thank you.